Hello and welcome to this video on sexually transmitted infections for the general practice theme. Today we're going to be talking about a variety of different STIs, but first let's see what you already know on this topic by way of a few questions. So firstly, which herpes simplex viruses are responsible for genital herpes? So remember HSV is herpes simplex virus, HIV is human immunodeficiency virus, and the correct answer here is A, HSV 1 and 2 have the ability to cause genital herpes. Question 2. Syphilis is a complex systemic STI caused by what? Is it a fungus, a spirochet, a helminth or a virus? So the answer here is a spirochet. And question three, as chlamydia is often asymptomatic, treatment is often commenced on a presumptive basis. Is this true or false? Indeed, it's true. So chlamydia is usually asymptomatic and a patient at high risk is likely to have the condition. So good to start treatment early whilst you confirm the diagnosis. So today we're going to be talking about chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, trichomonas, gen genital herpes, and then we'll finish off with a couple more questions to cement that knowledge. We'll be going through these fairly quickly, um, as there's quite a lot to cover in one video. So for chlamydia, this is a urogenital infection, and it's one of the commonest STIs. A the causative organism behind chlamydia is chlamydia trachomatis, and it is usually asymptomatic in both men and women. Having said this, they may present with some symptoms, so for example in men there may be discharge from penis, and in women there may be cervical inflammation or yellow cloudy discharge from a cervical loss. If it's untreated or inadequately treated, it risks a possible ascending infection and further complications as a result. And as a result, also patients may risk spreading that infection to their sexual partners. So what are those risk factors for chlamydia? Anyone aged under 25 who is sexually active this group essentially represents the most at risk. Also, new sexual partners or multiple sexual partners, these patients are at an increased risk, as well as sexual activity from a known infected partner. Also, condoms not being used is a risk factor, and a history of a prior STI also raises your chances of having chlamydia. So how is chlamydia diagnosed? Essentially, the presence of risk factors alone increases the likelihood of infection. And asymptomatic, so it may not be detected early. And therefore, this is why we talked about earlier about commencing treatment before you have a definitive diagnosis. As well as the fact it can be asymptomatic, it is important to recognise some of the common symptoms that you may see on diagnosis for both men and women. And these are highlighted here with a W for women and an M for men. So how do you manage chlamydia? Of course, go by local trust guidelines. However, Firstly, the first line is azithromycin, 1 gram orally as a single dose, or doxycycline, 100 milligrams orally, twice a day for 7 days. Uh, this treatment algorithm here is appropriate for men and non-pregnant women, and should you want to treat any pregnant women or uh, any other cases, then you should refer to a BNF for the best treatment uh, management summary. Moving on, we have gonorrhea. So this is another common STI, and this is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea, which is a gram-negative diplococcus bacterium. In men, it typically presents with urethral discharge, and in women, it is often asymptomatic. But having said that, they may have some vaginal discharge. If gonorrhea is left untreated, Neisseria gonorrhea can disseminate to areas of the body to cause skin and synovial infections. And rarer complications can include meningitis and endocarditis, as we know Neisseria, meningitis can, uh, uh, Neisseria gonorrhea can cause these infections as well. So what are the risk factors for gonorrhea? Well, fairly similar to uh, those we talked about in chlamydia, but you've got that at-risk group of age 15 to 29. New ones for gonorrhea are men who have sex with other men, black ancestry, current or prior history of an STI, multiple recent sexual partners, inconsistent condom use, a partner who is infected, and a history of sexual or physical abuse. It's important to recognise those risk factors, and a lot of them run commonly as a theme through the different STIs. So there are a variety of investigations you can do to diagnose gonorrhea. But the key diagnostic features is the patient will have the presence of those risk factors we just talked about, maybe not all of them, but quite a number of them usually, and they may be asymptomatic. We've already talked about that potential urethral discharge in men or pelvic pain in women, as well as urethral irritation in men and dysuria. So how do you manage a patient with gonorrhea? Well, it's recommended that adult patients with confirmed gonorrhea be treated with dual antibiotic therapy, in other words, two antimicrobials with different mechanisms of action. So the most common choice we go for is uh, keftriaxone and as it from myosin um, and bear in mind metronidazole is also added for patients where there's been a history of sexual abuse. If we have complications in women the main complication is pelvic inflammatory disease so that's about ascending infection uh, with complications of the pelvic organs. So moving on we have syphilis which is a common STI caused by a spirochetal bacterium called Treponema 
pallidum. Clinical presentation is often asymptomatic, uh, but it may manifest in several different ways. So it's important to recognise that a lot of these STIs are asymptomatic. So it's important to identify the risk factors in your patient groups and go from there. Essentially, a painless ulcer in the anal genital region is a hallmark of primary infection of syphilis. An acquired infection is transmitted through direct person-to-person -person sexual contact with an individual with early uh, primary or secondary syphilis. And transmission from mother to fetus during pregnancy can cause congenital infection. It's important to remember that this can also be passed from mum to baby during pregnancy. What are the risk factors for syphilis? Uh, again, sexual contact with an infected person, men who have sex with men. Anyone here, illicit drug use is also a risk factor for syphilis, as well as com uh, commercial sex workers. Multiple sexual partners, people with HIV or other STIs. Syphilis during pregnancy increases your risk for congenital infection as well. So how about a diagnosis of syphilis? How are we going to go about it? Well, again, we're going to have those presence of risk factors. They may be completely asymptomatic, but just have a number of risk factors. They may have this uh, anogenital ulcer, which is kind of diagnostic of this primary syphilis, or they may also have lymphadenopathy. They could have a diffuse symmetrical macular papula or macular papula rash in secondary syphilis. And they may have those constitutional symptoms as well, which you may notice, such as fever, malaise, myalgia, fatigue or arthralgia. Also, they may have rhinitis, which is a sign of early congenital syphilis, and discharge may be purulent or bloody, and they may also have hepatosplenomegaly, so the last two there are for congenital infection of syphilis. So it's important to know the difference between primary and secondary syphilis particularly, but it's also important to be aware there are a couple of other types to be aware of. So primary and secondary are the two most common types you'll see. So primary syphilis, um, you'll see in a time span of around 10 to 90 days, with this common ulcer that we talked about uh, on the anogenital region and local lymphadenopathy may also occur. If it's secondary, then you're more likely to see this over a longer period of time, over one to three months, these manifestations of symptoms. And they may also have these uh, secondary symptoms like arthralgia, fatigue, uh, headaches and rashes as well. So how do we treat syphilis? Empirical therapy may be considered in those with suspected early infection. Uh, before the serology is available. So primary option here is benzophene benzalpinacillin, and that's 1.8 grams IM as a single dose, uh, as it is in the BNF in 2019. Uh, and if the patient is allergic to penicillin, then doxycycline may be an alternative. Sexual contacts of patients with confirmed syphilis should be screened and offered presumptive treatment if follow-up may be problematic as well. So moving on now, we have Trichomonas vaginalis. So this is a very common STI that can cause vaginitis, cervicitis, and urethritis. Differential diagnosis. Essentially, when you're considering the differential diagnosis of an STI, it tends to be other STIs that you have to consider. So other sexually transmitted infections, such as, uh, such as bacterial vaginosis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, herpes simplex, and so on. Um, in terms of investigations for Trichomonas, you want to do a high vaginal swab, which can be taken from a posterior fornix. Um, patients can do this themselves or you can do it in clinic, but the sensitivity may be low as motility reduces with transmit time. And follow this, you want to refer them to a GUM clinic to be formally diagnosed. And contractation should also be undertaken with any patient who's got trichomonas. So males, with the, how will they be diagnosed? Well, they can be asymptomatic, but they may also have that dysuria or urethral discharge. Um, but often there's no abnormal signs on examination. A female may be easily confused with bacterial vaginosis, so it's important to tell the difference between the two. 70% of women will have vaginal discharge, which is a frothy yellowish colour, uh, and they may also have vulva lichen, dysuria, and offensive odour as well. So how do we manage it? It's important to treat both partners, uh, because it is, of course, sexually transmitted, and sexual intercourse should then be avoided for at least one week following receiving treatment in trichomonas vaginalis. So, all trichomonas is easily treated with metronidazole, but resistant strains are currently on the increase. And metronidazole can still be used in all stages of pregnancy and during breastfeeding, which is an advantage of this. Lastly, we talk about genital herpes. So the major clinical manifestations of infections with herpes simplex virus uh, are oral, genital and ocular ulcers. So commonly seen are oral and genital in practice. So genital herpes is caused by infection with either HSV1 or HSV2. And the first clinical episode of genital ulceration may represent either new acquisition of the virus or newly recognised disease with a remote acquisition of the virus. And it's important as well to note that sexual contact passes the infection uh, from patient to patient. 
So how do we diagnose? Uh, gentle herpes again, it comes back to risk factors, uh, so it's important to be aware of the risks. So HIV infection increases your risk of gentle herpes, autoimmunosuppressive medications, high risk sexual behaviour. And going about diagnosis again, you need to look for those presence of risk factors. Dysuria may be present in women, as well as lymphadenopathy, a gentle ulcer, and oral ulcers as well. Uh, so the patient may have co-commonant uh, gentle and oral ulcers. So how do we manage this? Well, we can investigate it first with viral cultures, HSV polymerase chain reaction, uh, and a glycopeptin G-based type specific serology. And treatment for the first episode is oral acyclovir, uh, three times daily for seven to ten days. And therapy should be started within 48 to 72 hours of onset of signs of symptoms for best outcome. You can also manage their symptoms with paracetamol ibuprofen to manage these systemic symptoms as well. Um, it's important to consult the BNF as well uh, for local guidance and also local trust guidance um, in terms of managing these. Here we have uh, an example of gentle herpes. This is a particularly classic rash that you'd see in the genital region. And here we have syphilis. This is the rash that you'd see uh, in secondary syphilis. And this is the uh, genital ulcer that you would see in primary syphilis. So to finish off, let's go back to those questions we looked at at the start. So for herpes simplex virus, gentle herpes, you're looking at HSV 1 and 2. For question 2, syphilis is a complex systemic STI caused by a spirochet. And question 3, it is indeed true that chlamydia is often asymptomatic, and therefore we do commence treatment on a presumptive basis a lot of the time. I hope you find this uh, tour of STIs fairly useful. It was just a brief overview of them. Uh, and hopefully we'll be covering them more in detail elsewhere uh, on the website. Thank you very much for listening. And if you do have any contact, uh, any questions, please feel free to get in touch as always. Thank you.